Well, good morning, church, and welcome to our Good Friday service. We're going to spend a time entering into worship and remembering what Jesus did for us on the Friday before the Sunday, enduring what he did on our behalf so we could be called righteous, so we could be made free, so we could be in relationship with God our Father. So let's join in together wherever you are today and sing these songs of worship. How marvelous, how wonderful in my song shall it
of white The blazing sun Shall pierce the night And I will rise Among the saints My gaze transfixed On Jesus' face God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 하나님이 이 세상을 이처럼 사랑하사 독생자를 주셨으니 이는 저를 믿는 자마다 멸망치 않고 영생을 얻게 하려 하심이니라. Vì Đức Chúa trời yêu thương thế gian đến nỗi đã ban con một của ngài hầu cho hễ ai tin con ấy không bị hư mất mà được sự sống đời đời. Permission ne dunia de lokanu inna pyar kita ate usne unna nu apna iklota putr vi de ditta ta jo koi vi us vich vishwas rakhta hai ਗਵਾਚੇਗਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਗੋਂ ਸਦੀਵੀ ਜੀਵਨ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਤ ਕਰ ਲਵੇਗਾ ਹੋਨ 316 ਸਪਗਤ ਗਏ ਨਾ ਲਾਮੰ ਅਮ ਪਗਸਿੰਤਾ ਨੇ ਜੋਸ ਸੰਗ ਲਿਬੁਤਨ ਨਾ ਇਬਿਨਿਗਾਈ ਨੀਆ ਅੰ ਕੰਨਿਆਂ ਬੁਗਤੋਂ ਨਾ ਨਾਕ ਉਪੰ ਅੰ ਸਿਨੋਮੰ ਸਾ ਕੰਨਿਆ ਇਸ ਮੰ ਪਲਤਾਇਆ ਐ ਹੋਗ ਮ ਪਹਾਮ ਕੁੰਦੀ ਮ ਕਰੋ ਨੰ ਬੁਹਾਈ ਨਾ ਵਲੰ ਹੰਗਾਂ Porque de tal manera amó Dios al mundo, que ha dado su Hijo unigénito, para que todo aquel que en él crea no se pierda, mas tenga vida eterna. Nu cu alăbrăhană când să ai o adăvăsat și cu Hristos pe ei că să vă uci. 
ክርስቶስ ኢየሱስ ተነስቷል መቃብሩን ፈንክሎ ድንጋውን አንከባሉ የኛ ጌታ ተነስቷል አሜን ተነስቷል यहोना 3:16 क्योंकि परमेश्वर ने जगत से ऐसा प्रेम रखा कि उसने अपना इकलौता पुत्र दे दिया ताकि जो कोई उस पर विश्वास करे वह नाश न हो परंतु अनंत जीवन पाए Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son Fils unique, afin qu'un qui croit en lui ne périsse pas, mais ait la vie éternelle. Dieu a aimé de tel modo le monde, qu'il a entregé son Fils unique, pour que tout le monde ne le croit, ne se perde, mais ait la vie éternelle. Denn so sehr hat Gott die Welt geliebt, dass er seinen einzigen Sohn hergegeben hat, dass keiner verloren geht, der an ihn glaubt, sondern damit er das ewige Leben hat. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3:16 is perhaps one of the most well-known verses in the Bible, but sometimes when things become well-known, they can sort of get glossed over, right? And and forgotten. And when they're actually meant to be contemplated deeply and remembered, And so I think John 3:16 may be such a verse. And so that's this uh, this good Friday. Let's slow down and and take a deeper look at John 3:16. And so the verse begins with the words for God so loved the world. That's everyone. Uh, note that the verse does not say this for God so loved the wealthy or the accomplished or the successful or the educated or the upper class only nor does the text mention any certain religion or race or age or gender or orientation the text says for god so loved the world that's a lot of people god's love is as inclusive as it gets And so no matter who you are today or where you live or where you're from or even how you feel about yourself you are loved by God. To be human is to be loved by God. You are loved by him deeply. For God so loved the world. The text continues that he gave his one and only son. And so in 1992 Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages it's five of them and the whole premise is that people communicate love in one of these five languages and these languages are uh, words of encouragement they are acts of service quality time a physical touch and the last one is giving gifts And so God uses all these languages to communicate his love for the world. But maybe the most profound um language that he's used to communicate is the the language of giving gifts. In particular, uh, one that is incredibly valuable, his one and only son. And so now many people, if you do a quick search on most valuable gifts ever given, many people have given incredibly valuable gifts. And you'll find things like this, a $275,000 bottle of wine. I don't know if you'd ever crack that bottle open. How about this one, a solid gold bathtub. Uh that is courtesy of Mike Tyson to his wife. You'll find things like multi-million dollar jets and mega yachts and priceless works of art. You'll also find a 69 carat diamond that was given to Elizabeth Taylor. you'll see the 19th floor the entire floor of the tallest building in the world was given as a gift 
you'll find that a waterfall and an island was given by Angelina Jolie to her then husband Brad Pitt. You'll find that the Taj, uh, sorry, the Taj Mahal was a gift. And the Statue of Liberty is another example, a gift that was given from the people of France to the people of the United States. And so many people have given incredibly valuable gifts, but people don't typically give away a child, a willingly giving away their child as a gift. And so the fact that God gave his one and only son as a gift really sets him apart uh, not only in terms of generosity, but in his depth of love. And so this gift, it says very clearly in John 3, 16, is an act of love. And so his love is deeper than that of any other. And I think not only did he give his son, but when we think about what that word gave means, what he was given into, what situation he was given into, it becomes all that much more valuable because if any human actually gave away their child, and it does happen in different circumstances, you would think that that parent would want that child to grow up in a good situation where they'd be provided for, where they would have the best opportunities possible, right? And that's a good thing. But when we look at the fact that God's son was not given into a wealthy family, for example, giving him the best opportunities in life. Uh, nor did God give his son during a time of peace when life would be free from threat and free of harm. Neither did God give his son to a geographical location that was free of conflict and the risk of persecution. No, not at all. But God actually gave his son to a poor family. Uh, during a time of hostility and to a location that was the center of conflict. And so ultimately, when you look at this, God gave his son over to mistreatment and actually over to death. And so when God gave his son into this, it just gives us a deeper meaning of God's incredible love. And so when God gave his son, he gave his son very clearly during a time in a location and even to a family line that was purposeful. There was a purpose to this. And so part of the reason that, that God gave his son was to show us what God is like and, and what he's like in a variety of situations, not just when everything is really good, but in bad times. God gave his son to give us an example of what it means to be truly human, to sacrificially show love and compassion to others. And again, I would say ultimately that God gave his son to save people from their sins. This was God's plan all along. It was purposeful. It had intentional. It was missional. And so God didn't just send his son on a field trip, but sent his son on a rescue operation. And so this rescue operation, it's really important to understand, it was well planned out. The Bible says that this rescue operation was planned actually before the creation of the world. And you can take a look at that. We, we've been studying the, the book of 1 Peter in chapter 1. Take a look there. And so when Jesus, God's son, was given to the world, the world mistreated him. And Good Friday shows us the extent of that mistreatment and his death. But God knew about this before it happened. And it was planned out as an act of love to save people from their sins. And so, again, the timing of all this and the intention behind it all was all planned out and it was motivated as an act of love by God himself. All this planning was an act of love. Now, I remember when I got engaged to Ange, I made a plan, I had it all planned out. And so I told her, you know what, we're gonna go into Vancouver uh, and my dad wants me to pick up a computer part from someone on Craigslist. You know, what an inconvenience, let's just go and make this happen. I was all playing it up, right? So I had a piece of paper with a fake name on it, Joe Ringer, and a fake phone number. 
and we were going into Vancouver and I got there and you know close to where we were supposed to be and I told Angela I gotta call Joe Ringer here and make sure that he's here. He said he'd be here during this time and made a fake phone call and oh man he's he's not in right now. We have an extra hour. What are we gonna do? Now it just so happened that we were in this area of Vancouver that uh, we love to go to uh, on walks and so I think it was right by Whitecliff Park. I should probably remember that. It was Whitecliff Park. And uh, she said, well, let's go to where we normally go. And I was like, this is working out perfect. My plan was, was going to uh, hopefully go forward exactly as I'd hoped. And so we got there and she you know, led us exactly to this place where we like to, to hang out. And lo and behold, there was a blanket set up there and some flowers and some candles. And I had planned that out and set it up beforehand. It was, it was, in my mind, it was perfect. And so I asked her to marry me and fortunately she said yes. And the rest is kind of history, but you know, it was well planned out on my part. I put a lot of work into this because I wanted to communicate to her that I really loved her. That was my hope in this. And so when we think about the fact that God had this all planned out before even the creation of the world, I mean, doesn't that tell us something about how much God wants to communicate his love for people? I mean, it really is profound. This whole entire narrative that we find ourselves in is a, a love story that God is, is, has written and has planned out a long time ago. So when we think about God's foreknowledge of what giving his son would mean and, and what saving people would cost that his one and only son, Jesus, was going to be betrayed, right? He was going to be abandoned. He was going to be mocked. He was going to be ridiculed. He was going to be uh, spat on. He was going to be slapped. He was going to be flogged. He was going to be persecuted, and he was going to be crucified. When we think about all these things happening to God's son, that God gave his son into this, and that this was planned out a long time ago, doesn't it give us a deeper meaning of God's love? I mean, it is so profound. There is nothing like it anywhere. I think someone's going to rightly ask this question. You know what? Why did it have to happen that way? Why did Jesus have to die such a horrific death? Why was this part of God's plan? Why couldn't he have simply died a, you know, a natural death? You know, lived um, an old age and, and, and died peacefully in his sleep. In fact, if, it, if he was such a great teacher, then wouldn't it have been better for him to live a longer life, you know, so that he could teach us even more? Why was his life cut short in his early 30s? And I think these are, are really, really good questions if you've ever had those or if you have those now, these are great questions. And so the Bible teaches us that, and this is why it was so costly, that Jesus, God's son, took on our sin on himself and that he paid the penalty for our sin. And so the penalty for sin that Jesus took on himself was very steep. And Isaiah 53 is a prophecy about Jesus and about how steep this cost is and about how he took it on himself. Let me read to you a couple verses from Isaiah 53. It says this, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. And so some of the onlookers saw Jesus on the cross there and thought, well, he must be being uh, punished by God for something maybe he did wrong. But the text says he was pierced, his hands and his feet, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that's on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And so I realize that talking about sin today, which the Bible also calls iniquities and transgressions, is not a popular topic for many. But the Bible is clear about the state of the human heart. And this text we said says 
sorry, this text we read, we read now says we all have gone astray. Uh, each of us, not some, but each of us has turned our, to our own way. And so how we feel about sin doesn't change what the scriptures say about it. The Bible says we all have it. And it's really costly. So to, to, to God, sin is a really big deal. And it separates people from him. It breaks that relationship with a loving God. It has massive consequences. And so these consequences for sin are most clearly seen on Good Friday in the death of Jesus Christ and the events that surrounded it. When he bore our sins and paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. You know, for many, Easter is a family holiday. And I remember trying to explain the crucifixion <laughs> and the events of Good Friday to my kids when they were really young. And it was, it was a bit tricky. You know, it's, it's not easy to understand. It's not easy to explain this event that's so graphic to a child who's so young. And so I told them, you know what? Imagine that you got in trouble for doing something that you knew you were not supposed to do. Now, what if the consequence for doing that was that you had to have a time out? Not much fun, is it? My kids, you're like, oh yeah, that's, I don't like going in time out. Now, what if the consequence um, for this was paid for by someone else? Uh, what if someone went into time out for you, like your sibling or something? Has it ever happened to you? Like, no, that's never happened to, to us, for us, right? And I said, well, this is kind of what Jesus did. He, it's like he went into time out for us. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I said, isn't that amazing that, that Jesus would do that, would go into time out for us? But the consequence is much steeper than uh, time out. You know, for each person who believes in Jesus, all of the consequences for all the wrong they've ever done and ever will do at once is paid for by Jesus when he went to the cross. It's a lot of people, it's a lot of wrongdoing, and it's a big consequence. And I think this helped their young minds to understand a little bit about what Jesus did on the cross. And I think this picture helps us understand why the crucifixion and why the events surrounding the crucifixion, the flogging and everything, were so horrific and so necessary. You see, sin, any amount of it, is a huge offense against a holy God who created us. And there is this unchanging principle that sin, it cannot go unpunished. There are consequences for sin. In fact, the Bible says that sin has to be paid for by the blood of someone innocent. So sin has been fully paid for in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross for everyone who believes in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that is what is so profound about the love of God is that he counted the cost of our salvation. He knew what it would cost and he paid the price God willingly sent his son to save us from our sins. Timothy Keller says this, The gospel is this, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared believe hope. God did not leave us alone in our sin, uh, destitute for all eternity, but he saved us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so for us, this Good Friday, when we think about Jesus dying on the cross, we must remember John 3, 16, that it says, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Again, this gift of love and salvation is for whoever believes in him. This gift is offered to everyone who believes in the gospel. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is saved. This gift is incredibly expensive to God. It's a value that we cannot fathom, but it is free to us. That's what a gift is. It's free to us. And we're offered it through the good news, through the gospel message to be received by faith. When someone's saved, the Bible teaches that they are saved from perishing, right? We're reading about that. Instead, they're given eternal life. And so through their faith in Jesus Christ, they're saved from perishing and saved into this eternal relationship with a loving God. And so that relationship, it begins the very moment a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And so I wonder, this Good Friday, are you ready, if you haven't already, to put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, to save you from your sins, and to enter you into this eternal relationship with a loving God? And if you are ready for that this Good Friday, then I want to invite you to pray along with me in just a moment. Now, for those of you who do believe in Jesus Christ, you know, let today be a reminder that we take, when we take communion together, that Jesus' broken body for us and his shed blood for us was to restore us into a relationship with him that's meant to be ongoing. That he is a God who loves to commune with people. That you are in this relationship with him. And so when we take the bread and we break it, when we break the bread, it's symbolic of Jesus' broken body for you out of love for you. And when we take the cup and we drink it, we remember Jesus shed blood on the cross, which was done out of love for you. And so he loves you as much today as he did when you first believed. Any drift in relationship with God is not because of a fading love from him to you. And so I'd really encourage you to come back to him, return to him with your whole heart. The Bible says to repent is to turn to him. And the Bible says that he will eat with you and commune with you again. I'd encourage you to open your Bibles again if they've been sitting closed. To talk with him. Tell him about what's going on in your life and ask him to forgive you. And enter into that deep relationship with him. I'd say especially over these next couple of days when we think about the events of the crucifixion. Uh, read over them again and contemplate all that Jesus did for you and for me on the cross and what it means for you. Think about the fact that God gave his son as a gift into this to restore you, to forgive you and be in a relationship with you. I wanna remind you that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was incredibly costly and it is completely sufficient to forgive all of your sin and all of my sin, all of it, to wipe it away and to allow us to enter into this relationship with him. And so I'm going to pray now, and I want to first of all pray for those who are ready to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to receive this gift, to receive salvation. I'm going to pray, lead you through a prayer first, and then I'm going to pray about everyone who's taking communion today. So let me, let me lead uh, those of you who want to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior in a prayer first. 
God, I look at my life and I agree that there is sin in my life, that there are things that are done out of unbelief. And there is, when I think about some things in my life, there is a sense of guilt there. And God, at times it's heavy. And so God, I want to confess today that I, I, I have sin in my heart. And there's things that I've done that have, have been wrong in your sight. Lord, I also want to thank you for giving an incredible gift that you gave your one and only son to die on a cross in my place, to be my substitute. God, I believe that he took all of my sin and that his body was broken for me and that his blood was shed for me. And I believe that his sacrifice in my place covers all of my sin. And so today, God, I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my sin as I put my faith in what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And I'm receiving that free gift of salvation and forgiveness that comes from you. And I'm telling you today, God, I don't want to live my life as I used to. I don't want to do things out of unbelief. But I want you, Jesus, to be my Lord and Savior. And I want to live for you. So God, forgive all my sin. And Jesus Christ, come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. I receive you today as my King. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And Lord, for the rest of us who are taking communion today, when we break the, bo- the, the bread and we eat it, we're, we are remembering your broken body for us. And as we take that cup and we drink it, we are remembering your shed blood on the cross for us. And we recognize in a fresh way today that this was done out of a deep love for us, that it was planned out long ago. And God, we are amazed at how great your love is for us, that you would plan this and that you would do this for us so that we can be restored into a relationship with you. And so God, we remember that. And I pray, God, that you would help us to love you more and that you would help us to take steps to walk closely with you. And so Lord, remind us and renew in us a great love for you. Lord, thank you for the cross. We are so grateful that you would have done this for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship Come Just as you are before your God Come You broke the bread press the Sacrifice of love, holy, holy, holy. Wanna see the glory of all that you are and all that you've done. Jesus, the Lamb of God, oh, what a Savior. Took the altar and made it a table, and nothing can separate. You bring together now and forever. I will remember i
my hope alive in me worthy 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 I'm caught up in the glory of all that you are and all that you've done Jesus the Lamb of God oh to say took the altar and made it a table and nothing can separate what you bring together now and forever I will remember now and forever I will Such a friendship to be 
with you, my God. So let everything I am, I throw into your hands. And I just want my life to ever be in trouble. Take me deeper I want to be where you are I want to be where you are Draw me closer Take me deeper Ah. Uh... 